Foreign Policy Hour, uh, coming to you from uh, uh, Jojage, which has long been a, a meeting point of various uh, First Nations, otherwise known as, uh, as, uh, as Montreal. And uh, today, uh, there's no guests today. Um, so I'm going to do a uh, longer uh, discussion of this, fortunately, unfortunately, uh, depending on the issue, there's a lot of issues to, uh, to delve into. Uh, and also should leave a little bit more time for, um, for a discussion at the end, uh, which was cut off uh, last, uh, last uh, uh, episode. So I thought I would start with um, Ecuador. Uh, a positive note, uh, there's major protests the last two weeks in Ecuador, um, uh, led by the uh, CONAI, the major uh, indigenous uh, uh, federation. And, uh, and uh, it's even prompted uh, 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 some discussion of actually having uh, Guillermo Lasso's uh, uh, government uh, fall and there's been a vote uh, in Parliament about that. I don't think they have the numbers quite yet to, to do that, but I think they're not that far away from, from doing that. And um, the protest is really against neoliberal policies. They're calling for price uh, controls on uh, gas, agricultural products, calling for increased spending on education, healthcare. And also they're calling for a moratorium on uh, or, or a ban on um, a mining uh, concessions in indigenous areas. And that, of course, is something that the Canadian government does not like uh, whatsoever. Much of what the Canadian government does in Ecuador is advance the interests of Canadian uh, mining companies. And so it should maybe not surprise us that the Canadian embassy uh, put out a statement calling the protests, quote, violent riots. Now, in the real world, of course, it's, um, it's, uh, the protesters has been four protesters killed by uh, mostly viewed as by 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 security forces so it's of course uh uh you know the security forces that are the the, the engaged in the main acts of the quote unquote violent riots um but this is just another uh, indication of the canadian government uh opposed to to um uh to popular uprising uh the partly because of mining and partly also because Lasso is, you know, one of a diminishing number of um, allies of the Trudeau government, the, you know, staunchly pro-corporate, staunchly pro-Washington allies in a region where the um, increasingly there's been a rise of, uh, of more progressive uh, anti-imperialist pro-Latin American integrationist uh, uh, politicians uh, 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 winning in um, taking office in different countries. So, so this is an interesting development. This would be another major blow. If, if Lasso is actually uh, ousted, uh, that would be a major blow to, uh, to Trudeau's uh, uh, Latin American strategy, which is already um, facing a lot of blows and would be a blow to uh, Canadian mining interests. I think irrespective here, it's probably putting the Canadian mining interests on the back foot in the country. And there's many examples of Canadian mining interests involved in, in uh, conflicts with local communities, particularly indigenous uh, uh, communities in, uh, in Ecuador. Uh, in another development on Canadian foreign policy that I think is also uh, you know positive development, like the, uh, the, the mass protests in, in Ecuador, another positive development is uh, Erwin Kotler. And Erwin Kotler uh, this week was forced to pull his name as the keynote speaker to a conference coming up in, I'm not actually not until November, at Ariel University, which is deep in the uh, West Bank, uh, uh, a controversial university that is in an illegal Israeli uh, settlement. I mentioned this uh, last week that Kotler was uh, going to be giving this speech. I, I learned about it. Uh, I found out about it uh, just searching his name uh, uh, last uh, late Sunday night uh, 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 last week. And uh, that was picked up by uh, Michael Buckert and the Canadians for Justice and Peace in the Middle East. Uh, ultimately, Independent Jewish Voices picked it up, uh, Canadian Palestine Association. Uh, uh, and then the, the, the uh, Palestinian uh, uh, representative 
in Ottawa, the Palestinian Authority's representative in Ottawa reached out. I'm not, it's not clear who she exactly reached out to. If she reached out to Kotler's office or she reached out to uh, somebody within the Trudeau government to ask about this, his, his speaking on this, uh, this uh, university that's, you know, contravention of international law. And, and I think that was on Thursday. And they told uh, her, the, the Palestinian representative, that no, he was not uh, uh, going to be speaking at that. It's not clear if they're trying to claim that he never agreed to speak at it, or if you know now that there there's been pressure building that that he was withdrawing. Um, but today, uh, Canadians for Justice, Justice and Peace in the Middle East uh, reported that the conference schedule that's online has now withdrawn uh, Kotler's name uh, from the schedule. So so it appears what what the Palestinian representative reported is is. Um, is uh, turning out to be uh, to be true. So this is a you know this is not a huge victory. We shouldn't exaggerate, but it's a small little victory that is you know a blow to the Israel lobby in the, in this country. I think a blow to uh, Kotler. Personally, I was hoping that Kotler was not going to make this decision this quickly. I was hoping that we were going to have uh, weeks, if not months, to build pressure on this question and to discredit the special envoy to combat anti-Semitism, the position that, that Kotler has, which is not a special envoy to combat anti-Semitism. It's a special envoy to deflect criticism of Israeli apartheid. And Kotler has done a lot of things that suggest that that's the real objective, is to deflect criticism of Israeli apartheid. But this speaking at a, a um, settlement university, which is the, even the Canadian government officially says contravenes international law, the settlement of the Ariel settlement, a, a university that's very controversial within Israel as well, even Israeli academics, many, many Israeli academics have boycotted the university. Uh, there's been international campaigns to boycott the university. So this is, this is, a, this is an initiative, or, or Kotler speaking at the Ariel really speaks to him representing a, you know, a, a belligerent, uh, particularly belligerent strain of, of the Zionist uh, uh, movement or of, uh, of Israeli uh, politics. So to me, this was a question that the longer this could play out, um, the, the better from the standpoint of, of exposing what Kotler uh, uh, you know, represents. And, and um, it also rep reflects, in my opinion, the fact that Kotler, the, the, the utility of the special envoy to combat anti-Semitism if people know that this, this position is really not about combating anti-Semitism, but that it's just about deflecting criticism of Israel, the, the, the position has no utility anymore. It only, it's only a useful tool if it can appear that it's doing something more noble, that, it, that it's doing something uh, 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 more general. So, so again, I think that you know, it's, uh, it was a really dumb decision by Owen Kotler to agree to speak. Uh, it, it reflects the fact that he's, uh, I think, a little getting increasingly divorced from the political landscape in Canada and sort of liberal opinion on this question and getting in increasingly tight with, with the, you know, sort of hard right uh, in Israel. Um, but it, but it, nonetheless, it's, it's, a, it's a small victory. It would have been probably better if the victory came in another month from now when there was even more attention uh, uh, focused on the issue. Now, Erwin Kotler is, a, is an interesting uh, character. This is somebody who is a is, you know, very influential uh, player in, um, on the Palestinian question, on Israel more generally, and, and I would say even on Canadian foreign policy. Um, he, of course, is somebody who's defended, uh, you know, he, he uh, hosted a, basically a war rally last year when Israel was destroying Gaza for the uh, fifth or sixth time in, in the recent uh, last uh, 15 years. He, he, uh, he's defended all the previous Israeli assaults which left thousands and thousands of dead in Gaza. Uh, he's somebody who's you know, uh, opposed the International Criminal Court uh, prosecuting Israeli officials. He's somebody who called on Canada to move its embassy to Jerusalem. So he's taken all kinds of very uh, extremist uh, uh, positions over the years uh, on the Palestinian question. And he's somebody who's been pushing this whole idea of the new anti-Semitism. Uh, it actually goes back decades into like the 1980s. He was pushing that idea, which he just sort of repackages every, every, uh, 
every few years. Um, uh, but he's also somebody who, who, if you look at his uh, politics more generally beyond uh, Palestine, Israel, uh, and you know, and I think that is central to his politics. He's somebody who is a staunch Zionist, and you know, he 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 you know targets Iran partly as a way to uh, to undermine Iran as a as a counterbalance to uh, Israeli power in in the region. But but more generally, if you look at his his sort of human rights, he's you know framed as a human rights lawyer, activist. If you look at his human rights record, it's uh, overwhelmingly uh, um, uh, he 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 focuses on the rights record of countries that are uh, targets of of Washington, right? He's concerned about human rights in Russia and China uh, and Venezuela, and he's he was right at the center of the campaign to bring Venezuela to the International Criminal Court. He was part of this organization, American States uh, Initiative to basically condemn the Venezuelan government. He's a, a lawyer for um, major opposition uh, uh, figure, hard right opposition figure in Venezuela. So he's been right at the center of uh, pushing a aggressive campaign uh, that obviously the Canadian government American government have been waging to uh, to try to oust uh, the Venezuelan uh, um, uh, government. Um, so he's a really a human rights lawyer at the service of empire, right? He's a human rights activist at the service of empire. If a country is under the under the um, uh, the boot or is in the crosshairs of Washington, Erwin uh, uh, Kotler is, you know, finding out, uh, raising the question of human rights in those countries. Look at, look to find out Erwin Kotler talking about human rights violations in Haiti that the Canadian government is largely responsible for, and you'll find nothing about that. Uh, very little about human rights violations in Libya after Canada bombing or Afghanistan during Canada's war. Uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, so you know, not only is it the, do is it human rights uh, at the service of empire to enable uh, more aggressive policies uh, in any anybody who is has you know a, a little bit of seriousness about their politics. Of course, you know you focus on the crimes of your government and of those institutions that you have the most responsibility over. Uh, and Erwin Kotler uh, uh, basically never, uh, never uh, uh, does that. Do we have the video? So I'm actually going to just show a quick video of, um, of uh, uh, disrupting Erwin Kotler uh, three years ago. Um, go ahead. Volume. I don't think we can hear you. You're muted. Oh, oh, beyond, beyond, beyond the Palestinian Please leave us alone. We know, and we are still not acting. This is Emmanuel Erich. He disrupted our first Right City Conference. And last week, 
who he sponsored a talk with the Minister of Defense. He also interpreted that as a professional disruptor. Please, please. Thank you for that. Please. Please. No, you're 45 years old. Come on, come on. No, no, we work hard. Beyond the Palestinian. Please leave us alone. Please leave us alone. Justify Palestinian possessions. Mr. Carter has also been at center. Indian policy oh. an effort to overthrow the government Come on. in Venezuela. Yeah. Yeah. You, you can organize your own events and, and organize things. You're distracting us. You're being very uncivil. <laughs> You're not registered for this event. No, no, I'm not giving you my. Are you prepared to criticize Israel's jailing of Ahmed Khalid? Please. Are you prepared to criticize that? Listen. A teenager, young, young woman, young girl. No. You got silence? We, are, we have our security coming on board. Going once, going twice. Please. Come on, you can criticize it. It's Come on. The violence, violence. Oh, that's that's the the that was a, that was a, uh, disruption from a, a three years ago. And it was actually uh, Dimitri Lascaris followed up with a, a, uh, a very, uh, a more clinical, I would say, uh, kind of lawyerly uh, grilling of, uh, of uh, Erwin Kotler. The, it was fascinating to see the reaction to this disruption. Uh, the House of Commons a few days later actually uh, <laughs> had a unanimous resolution. I don't know that all uh, MPs were there, uh, but they unanimously condemned us for having uh, disrupted uh, Kotler's speech. The whole thing lasted for like maybe 10 minutes max. Uh, he got to do the whole presentation. The conference, they had, they had been refusing to take questions. They frame it as a sort of academic discussion, but they had been refusing to take questions at the conference. Uh, so they, you know, I mean, you can, you can have a debate one way or another of whether uh, uh, academic discussions should be, you know, should be uh, uh, disrupted. But you certainly, when you're, when you're not actually having uh, uh, open debate, uh, you certainly can't be too uh, can't complain too uh, loudly about about that. Um, so so Kotler is somebody who is who is uh, very uh, influential in Canadian foreign policy, and it, and it's really important that the there was a blow to uh, um, his uh, you know his position as a special uh, envoy. Um, so shifting gears uh, to the to the issue that I want to spend the most uh, time on discussing, and it's really uh, kind of a remarkable uh, what's developing here, is the question of, of of Ukraine and the fact that Canada is clearly now has to be understood to be at war uh, with Russia. On the weekend, the New York Times reported that that the the um, that Canadian special forces alongside American, UK, and French special forces are on the ground in Ukraine, providing assistance, providing intel gathering intelligence on Russian forces, uh, training, uh, other assistance to the Ukrainian uh, forces. So this, this was confirming what uh, was reported on back at the end of January of Canadian special forces being dispatched uh, to Ukraine but has been you know, not, not really followed up on. The Department of National Defense uh, and uh, a Minister Anand's office was, failed to respond to the Ottawa citizen to ask about the, the, uh, this report in the New York Times, um, which included stuff about the CIA, the CIA's operations in Ukraine and, and just adding more layers to what was already, you know, different reports had, had put out about there of just the extent to which the U.S. and and uh, U.K. special forces and other countries' uh, uh, forces are are part of this this war. Um, uh, at the same time, they there was a report that uh, a couple of media outlets talked about how Rick Hillier, the the uh, former chief of the defense staff, the Canadian military, uh, that he's taken up this position with the territorial defense, heading up this new council. To, to advise and to fundraise and to equip the Ukrainian territorial defense. Uh, so it, it's just, you know, one more, there's, you know, all kinds of reports about Canadian forces, former Canadian military on the ground in Ukraine. And the, you know, early on, the Canadian government was encouraging Canadians to enlist, join 
the uh, the, the the foreign legion um, uh, fighting in Ukraine of um, uh, non-Ukrainians fighting for the uh, fighting Russia. Uh, and so this is this is part of the context. There's also the you know obviously Canada has these incredible sanctions um, uh, on 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 uh, Russia, uh, which is part of the the uh, the you know war effort. Canada's providing all kinds of money to the Ukrainian uh, uh, military, lots and lots of weapons, more than six hundred million dollars in Canadian weaponry has either been sent or is allocated to Ukraine. And the, the Canadian government is, you know, really aggressive in all its statements, opposing, you know, saying this is a clash of civilizations, a fight for freedom, while opposing negotiations. The sanctions, the international sanctions campaign, which is unprecedented, of, of, uh, of, of uh, taking Russian assets, seizing a central bank, $300 billion in Russian assets. That's Christian Friedland that led the charge on that. Just uh, a couple of days ago, Canadian Parliament passed a, a, a um, uh, confirmed the legislation that the Canadian government has put forward to take the, the seized Russian assets and give them to the Ukrainians. So Canada has been pushing other countries to follow suit. There's been a certain degree of reticence, I think, from different countries on that question, because uh, that, that, according to a CBC article, that almost certainly violates uh, uh, international law, but the Canadian government is right at the forefront of, 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 that, of that campaign. And it's important, once, you know, the point, the idea about the seizing the assets is as putting pressure on Russia to change path, right, to, to end its war. But once you, once you seize those assets, now you've lost any sort of anti-war logic, because now the Russian government has, has you know, no interest in, in trying to, like, you know, change direction on the hope, in the hopes that they'll get those assets back, now that you know, you might as well keep going. Um, so, so that's uh, uh, I think an important point. As part of this, the sanctions that Canada has been putting on Russia, there was, uh, I guess, it's a bit more than a week ago, but there's been a series of reports that have come out about the there's a part, important part that Simeon's, uh, Siemens, the big uh, German company, has a has a uh, a plant here in Montreal that has been doing repair work on part of the Nord Stream 1 natural gas pipeline. And because of Canadian sanctions, the Canadian government is refusing to allow the repaired part to be sent to Gazprom, the, the Russian uh, gas company. In response to this, the Russian government has uh, uh, cut its natural gas exports to Germany. There's some dis de debate about whether they're doing this because it's actually preventative or this is just a pressure tactic. I don't, I don't really know one way or another, but irrespective of what the reason is, whether Russia felt they, the Russian gas plant felt they had to do this, or if this is just a Russian pressure tactic, the effect of this is to put all kinds of, cause all kinds of damage to, uh, further damage to Germany. And all kinds of concerns around uh, natural gas imports, major impact on its uh, industry, which is you know really concerned about its uh, uh, energy source. Obviously, the price of natural gas has been going up in in Germany, and and to me, this is kind of illustrative of of a part of understanding the sanctions and Canada's position on the on the war in Ukraine and 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 the fight with Russia, which is that. Canada can pursue these, this is these sanctions, this policy with Simeon, Siemens, the German company and others. Yes, this has an impact. There's no doubt this has an impact on corporate Canada and different you know, economic interests in this country. But the real, beyond Russia and Ukraine, which are obviously the you know, main victims in all this, primarily Ukraine, of course, uh, uh, um, but but the but the 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 main victims of this policy are Germany and continental Europe, France, and and the Canadian government is relatively insulated from the real costs of, of this. And if you actually look at you know increased commodity costs, like yes, consumers in Canada are paying more, but Canada is a major producer of a lot of these commodities that the price has gone up drastically over the past uh, four months. Oil. Other other minerals, uh, uh, etc. 
So, so the, the sanctions regime that Canada is pursuing is to a large extent is, is, is actually the effect, you know, the major costs are being borne by uh, uh, continental Europe. Going further with this whole dynamic of, of how this is playing out, this week it was announced that the European Union provided, granted uh, Ukraine a step towards joining the European Union. Now, the European Union basically felt like they had to do this because they had to express their solidarity. It probably doesn't really mean that much in the, maybe in the long, long term, but probably this is, this is it's, the, it's not gonna, they're not gonna ultimately get, get status. But, but irrespective, let's just say Ukraine joined uh, the EU tomorrow. Well, Ukraine, I mean, Ukraine had before this, this, the destruction of its economy and, you know, five or six million people driven from the country and all that's happened over the past four months. Before that, it was one of the poor, it was the poorest country in Europe, right? It has a GDP of like not much more than $3,000 a year, right? It, it's like 40% of Mexico's GDP, right? It, so basically European Union, and now it's, you know, things are, you know, that much worse. So the European Union is basically going to bring in, bring in a charity case, a country that's going to be dependent on huge amounts of, of, of resource transfers from the rest of Europe to Ukraine. And so, 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 you know, yes, this might benefit Washington and Ottawa geopolitically, but from the standpoint of, you know, the economies of, of Germany, France, uh, this doesn't make any sense. And, 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 you know, a lot of, you know, there's been obviously part of, of understanding the Ukraine question has been that Washington wants to keep Europe under uh, its geopolitical umbrella and NATO is the main uh, tool of that. And, 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 and obviously Germany, France and Italy understand that in part what this is, what the effect of all of this and, and even the intent is, is, to, is, to, um, is to collapse them under the geopolitical umbrella. And, and even if it costs their economy, of course, you know, economic relations with Russia is very important for Germany, the, you know, uh, cheap energy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that's part of why Germany, France, and Italy are the ones that are pushing negotiations while the Canadian, UK, and US uh, oppose uh, uh, negotiations and, and are fine with prolonging uh, this, this fight. Another part that I'll, uh, uh, of, of the Russia-Ukraine thing that Canada's really been pushing is the food shortages. And this is a real issue, right? There's, there's real, uh, there's people that are being, you know, negatively affected, people right on the margins in places like Somalia, Egypt, um, that are being harmed by the uh, constrained uh, grain exports, right? Both from Ukraine, but also uh, from Russia. And the explanations for why those exports are not are not getting out as much. There's you know various factors. Part of it is is that you know the the ports, Ukrainian ports have been have been uh, have been you know there's Russian vessels. There's also but they've also been mined uh, by the by the Ukrainians. Um, uh, so you know the, the war has disrupted those exports, and Russia deserves a large degree of blame for that. Uh, there's no doubt about that. But also the sanctions. Have have impacted uh, Russian exports. Uh, difficulty for Russian to get insurance. Uh, so, but the Canadian government has really decided that this the, the food shortage question is something they're going to try to try to really weaponize and to and to focus on uh, on um, blaming Russia for the whole the whole question when in fact the uh, question is much more complicated than than they're they're framing it. And the, the, at the Commonwealth Summit that, um, that the Trudeau was just at, and uh, I haven't uh, dealt with that, but um, some interesting developments there as well. But at this Commonwealth su Summit, the Canadian government really tried to focus on the, the food shortage question and the Canadian media was all talking about how Russia's weaponizing uh, food shortages. And, and, and then the Canadian media framed it as the Canada was gonna take the complaints of the African uh, countries around food shortages, and they were going to take it to the G7 and bring this issue up. But in fact, it was Canada that was pushing the African countries of the Commonwealth 
to blame Russia. And the, the, the African countries are actually saying that, that um, you know, it's more complicated. They're actually blaming the sanctions in large part uh, uh, for, f- on Russia for the food shortages. Um, but, but one of the things the Canadian government's done with the food shortages is they've created this whole coalition of, of NGOs that they're going to they're match funding for to deal with the, the uh, food shortage question. And this is a real uh, uh, clear example of how Canadian aid, so Canada is going to provide aid to NGOs dealing with food shortages in Africa and, 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 and elsewhere that is caused uh, um, by, by the war uh, in Ukraine. But this is, this is a real clear example of how NGOs and Canadian aid is really a geopolitical tool, right? So the, so the aid funding is really designed to hype up the question and to put more blame on Russia and potentially even lead to an effort. And has been, this has been discussed about trying to uh, send naval vessels to the, the Black Sea to, to uh, uh, escort Ukrainian vessels taking, taking uh, grains out of the country. Well, that would, that would basically lead to you know, fighting with uh, uh, or potentially to fighting with, with Russian naval vessels and all the escalation that could come from that. Um, but the, but, but the, basically it's about the you know, demonize, blame Russia, put all the, put all, you know, try to build as much international attention to blaming Russia to, to justify more weapons, to justify more military uh, being deployed, et cetera, et cetera. And here you have these NGOs who go along with this, right? And this is, this is, this is longstanding, right? If you look at, you know, Canadian NGOs in Afghanistan before the invasion in 2001, right? Can't, there's basically no Canadian NGOs in Afghanistan and there's a huge explosion of Canadian a- NGOs in Afghanistan. So they follow government money, right? And, and one of the things that drives uh, Canadian aid funding is military intervention. And, and what I've called it the aid intervention principle or where the US and, and Canada kill, uh, Canada provides aid, right? So that if you go back, you look at uh, uh, Haiti in 2004, when Canadian troops and US troops go to Haiti, all of a sudden leads to explosion of aid and all kinds of Canadian NGOs that benefit from that. Uh, Afghanistan, you, even Iraq, uh, 2003 uh, US invasion of Iraq. You go back, in fact, the aid intervention principle goes back all the way to the Korean War uh, in the early 1950s. Um, so it, it's a real a further example of how, how aid is a geopolitical tool and how much of the official NGO world goes along with um, uh, this, this, uh, this uh, process. Um, I think I'm going to leave the uh, Commonwealth question aside to leave for more uh, uh, questions, but I just want to mention two other things just to, um, to get before getting into the questions and, and, and comments, um, which is the uh, two, two recent developments just actually yesterday that I saw. So one was Reuters had a story from Libya. And in this story from Libya, the, the, the article said, quote, like everybody else, Reuters spoke to, insert uh, a city in uh, Libya. He viewed the 2011 uprising as a foreign plot to destroy Libya and hankered for, a, for calmer times when Gaddafi lavished money on the city. So this is a real damning comment on Canadian NATO destruction of Libya in 2011, right? Everyone in the city, according to Reuters is saying that this was better before, before uh, we did this. This of course won't get any attention in Canada, right? Mm-hmm. There's no, no one's gonna be held to account for having, for having uh, uh, you know, voted for bombing Libya. There's no Canadian military officials that are going to be brought to the International Criminal Court. There's no you know, commentators who, justified the the war basically no you know uh, hit to their to their status or their their standing um but nonetheless it's important for us to <clears throat> remember uh um uh, that you know the the impacts of of canadian imperialism another one was protest in port au prince yesterday so yesterday in port au prince haiti thousands and thousands you can go on the Haiti Information Project's uh, uh, Twitter to, to see some of the images. Thousands and thousands marched uh, basically in support of uh, Jean-Bertrand Aristide. 
and the Lavalas mm. movement, mm. right? And so 18 years ago, we helped overthrow uh, Aristide. We, the American Canadian Special Forces secured the airport when American Marines in the middle of the night took him and literally physically put him on the plane and dumped him in the Central African Republic. And then, you know, all kinds of, well, before the ouster, in the lead up to the ouster and then after, all kinds of liberal Canadian officials, commentators justified Aristide is the devil and horrible and da 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 da, you know, he's a tyrant and all, you know, killer and all kinds of endless kind of, you know, he stole huge amounts of money and everything that you could, you could imagine was said him. And yet here, 18 years later, when Aristide has no power has, has, and hasn't had any power, you know, over any, anything really for 18 years, still thousands and thousands mm -hmm. march in support of him uh, being engaged in the, being brought into the political process, right? Putting to lie, of course, the mm -hmm. fact that that you know what was legitimated, what was used to legitimate the the uh, the uh, the coup, um, and and um, and again, this is you know no one no one in Canada is going to be uh, is going to be punished for overthrowing the government. There's nobody brought to the international criminal court. Uh, there's not, none of the politicians are are going to even really have their their uh, their uh, their standing uh, undermined. In, in the official uh, uh, record, but nonetheless, it's important to to uh, to to mark these occasions and to, and to see that you know this is you know yesterday in Haiti there was resistance uh, to Canadian imperialism. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the people commentating to Reuters were rejecting uh, Canadian imperialism. Um, so on that note, I thought I would uh, mm -hmm. uh, I'll leave it uh, open up to uh, questions and uh, comments and. Uh, <laughs> Laura, I think you 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 could, if you could mute yourself, that would be uh, much appreciated. Oh, sorry. Does anyone have uh, uh, comments or or questions? I think there's some comments in the uh, um, in the uh, the sidebar here, but uh, I'm just having a chance to read them. But any does anybody want to uh, you know verbalize a, a comment or question? I think you have to put your hand up if you do want to. Oh, go, go ahead, Laura. Well, I heard you mentioning about Germany and um, France really wanting negotiations now, but do you think that's genuine? I mean, it just seems very muted to me. It doesn't, is there, are they really pushing for negotiations after this latest G7 meeting? They all seem to be thumping their chests and I just wonder, is there a genuinely, a genuine push for negotiations from those two countries? No, I think would be the, is my, my, not, not, you know, I don't know for sure, but my, my sense is no, but, but that's like, if, if, if what you're saying is, are they willing to like get into an open fight with Washington over the issue? The answer is no, but is, is, do, you know, the Italian government put out a whole uh, uh, plan for, for um, ending the conflict. Right, uh, that's a couple of weeks ago. Um, uh, you know, the the if you go back to um, you know the Minsk Accords, that's the Germans and the French that negotiated that. Right, the Americans, Canadians, and British worked to undermine those uh, uh, peace agreement to end the conflict in eastern uh, uh, Ukraine. So the Germans and the and the and the French, uh, they're facing the much more of the brunt of the economics costs of uh, uh, this war. Uh, they, there's a, you know, there has been a historic, you know, tradition in French politics specifically about efforts to have uh, security arrangements in Europe outside of NATO, right? De Gaulle, uh, you know, presented some of that. And so there's, there's, a, there's a history there. That's something that the Americans have always tried to undermine. Right, they want they want uh, NATO to be the lead uh, security arrangement in Europe. Uh, so, yeah, is it genuine? No, I, I don't think Macron is willing to get into a, a real fight with Washington over it. Nor is Germany, the German or Italian governments. But um, but there's clearly a much greater 
desire for that there than there is in Ottawa. Hmm. Anne has a question. Go ahead, Anne. Hello, Eve. Thanks, as always. Um, I was really shocked to hear that you received a special condemnation in Parliament. For um, a long time, I've really been bothered by the 2016 vote that condemned, using the word condemned, those who advocated support of BDS. And uh, that, was, that vote was a um, conservative motion that was supported by the Liberals and grudgingly um, not supported by the NDP. But that was February 22nd, 2016. And um, do you know the date that your so, event, so to speak, occurred? I don't know the date. It was like three or four days, maybe a week uh, after the disruption. Uh, mm -hmm. I, and I think that it's on my, I posted, posted the video of the disruption of, of, uh, of Kotler uh, on my uh, Twitter uh, uh, five or six days ago uh, when the, uh, the Ariel University stuff came out. And I, and I should also, I also posted a video of, of, of uh, Dimitri uh, grilling him, and quite frankly, Dimitri did a did a did a better job uh, than than I did. Um, but uh, uh, so take a look at that too. But I don't know the date. It's sometime in in 2019. But I, I'm pretty sure the Canadian Jewish News did an article about it. Um, so if you punch in uh, Erwin Kotler House of Commons uh, resolution Concordia disruption, I'm pretty sure that that comes up in uh, in, uh, in 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 Google. And I, I should say, I just want to actually go further with that. Like one of the things. Um, you know, I've written when researching uh, Kotler and also researching uh, Elizabeth May, for instance. Elizabeth May did all kinds of events on Iran and other one on Venezuela um, with Kotler, right? So, so, so oh. Kotler has this 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 kind of glow as this like human rights official, and so people like even Elizabeth May. I think she probably would reevaluate that now because she, as she's moved into you know more uh, understanding of. Uh, Palestinian uh, dispossession and oppression. I think she that you know Kotler. She understands that Kotler is you know supports that. Um, but for for many years, someone like Elizabeth May, you know, was clearly this is from the outside. The appearance was is that the Kotler was leading the charge on like Iranian uh, Iranian uh, dissidents that had been jailed, and Elizabeth May was sort of lending her name to that to the Kotler led sort of uh, uh, initiative. And, and it just speaks to how, you know, he has this sort of glow in the, in the um, dominant media as this, you know, you know, civil rights kind of attorney. Another thing I've, I've pointed this out a few places and it's, I think it's kind of, kind of startling is like, so like Alan Dershowitz, Alan Dershowitz is uh, on the, uh, is a, a senior fellow at Kotler's uh, Raoul Wallenberg Center here in Montreal. Well, Alan Dershowitz is somebody, I mean, he's got this, you know, horrible anti-Palestinian record. He's, he's, was Donald Trump's lawyer, but he's also like okay. accused uh, uh, a sex offender, a rapist, who was right at the center of the whole Epstein uh, uh, scandal. He was Epstein, he's one of them got Epstein, the, the scandalous um, uh, uh, deal back in 20, 2008 or whatever, where Epstein basically didn't go to jail for all this. And then he's been accused uh, of, of, of uh, and there's a whole court case going on about that uh, uh, in raping one of the one of the women, and 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 um, and yet he, you know, he's still on the board of Kotler's, or he's still on the senior fellow with Kotler's with people like Thomas Mulcair and uh, a black uh, Cindy uh, uh, Black no uh, Blackstock, uh, Indigenous um, uh, Children's uh, Initiative. Um, and uh, you know a few other people, um, so it, it's really uh, it's really amazing to see how how Kotler uh, sort of still has this sort of glow glow of kind of you know human rightsy kind of stuff. I think it's it's being undermined, and I think something like speaking at a a really really not a not a good public relations uh, decision on his part to lend his name to speaking at a at a uh, a settlement uh, uh, a university. Um, but yeah, the fact that the House of Commons, like, you know, had put forward a resolution that was ostensibly unanimous, condemning us speaks to how Kotler has this sort of 
glow of being the uh, you know human rights uh, activist. Thanks so much for your response. But you know, I also am, well, I had long since learned to despise Dershowitz for other reasons, of course, but um, think that Clarence Thomas and, and Kavanaugh are in the US Supreme Court are basically accused of rape as well. And I just, of course, have been thinking about that in the last couple of days, but thanks for your extended response. Steve Uri's had his hand up for quite a while. Oh. I got my hand up. Go, go ahead, go, go, John, and then you're, I don't know, for some reason, I'm, I'm not able to see the, uh, the hands up. So go ahead, John, and then you're. Oh, okay. So um, I'm, I'm a, uh, an active with the, the, uh, the Courage group uh, in, in the left of the NDP. And um, so if we're thinking in terms of uh, concrete uh, demands of what, how, uh, how we could um, uh, popularize this issue and, and move, move it into the NDP, which is, of course, an independent Labour Party in Canada. So it, it, it has some hope there. And I always think the first thing would be uh, for uh, to call for a, um, a truce, to call for uh, Canada out of NATO, which was an old demand that we've been fighting for for decades. Canada out of NATO. And then uh, the, the other thing would be um, for an immediate truce uh, um, uh, inv involving a ceasefire with uh, with uh, uh, Ukraine and, uh, and and Russia. And I, I was wondering whether it would be appropriate and whether it's a good idea to, de to, uh, to um, demand of the UN. I know we don't have a, a lot, we, have a, we don't have many illusions about the UN, but it's there. And there's a large, the, the majority of the, of the, of the countries that, that are members of the UN would probably support a, a truce and a ceasefire, immediate truce and ceasefire. And, um, uh, and I don't know whether they would support um, uh, Ukraine and, uh, or, or Canada getting out of, out of uh, NATO. That's our business. But so what do you think of that, uh, that uh, path? I, I agree. I mean, when uh, Sec UN Secretary Guterres uh, went to uh, Kiev and Moscow, which I guess it's probably six weeks ago now, the Canadian government didn't in any way support the initiative. Right. They, but, but from the standpoint of courage, I, I honestly, my, what my uh, uh, suggestion would be way simpler. The, right. ND, the NDP should support a negotiated end to the war. Heather McPherson. The truth. Truth, yeah, but a negotiated. No, start with the truth, yeah. Yeah, but, but, but Heather McPherson has explicitly, the NDP foreign affairs critic, has explicitly opposed that. Oh, no. Well, so so has so has um, so has uh, uh, the Northern Ontario MP there, um, um, the punk you? rocker, the punk rocker guy there. Uh, oh, uh, Charlie, Angus? Charlie, no. Angus. Charlie Angus. Charlie yeah. Angus. Oh, Charlie no. Angus. Charlie Angus has explicitly, and then he blocked me. He blocked me for one, just just pointing out what he was calling for <laughs> on Twitter. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, so so this is this is the the. I mean, I obviously completely support Canada to NATO position, and that's been a long-standing position of of uh, the left and anti-war forces within the NDP, and that's a very fascinating historical uh, back and forth on that question internally. I completely agree with that. I also completely agree with uh, uh, you know calls for you know the UN to a truce or negotiated a settlement, all that, but. Literally at this point, all I think of, you know, it would be a victory to get the party to just say that they're calling on the Canadian government for negotiations, no mm -hmm. negotiated settlement. Their, 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 their position is so extreme mm -hmm. that the NDP is saying they're, they're hostile to a negotiated, and Heather McPherson has, mm -hmm. has tweeted that out a couple times, variations of that a couple times. It sounds sustainable. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that would be the first move, yeah. Uh, Yuri, go ahead. Hi, Eve. Uh, yeah, just a very quick uh, question, and it's uh, you know going back to what uh, to you know, or and it's kind of related to Erin Kotler and re and related to the episode of last week. Uh, now, Canada was at the uh, Common uh, Wealth, and I thought it was very interesting. Uh, Prince Charles was saying that, hey, if you want to leave the Commonwealth, you can leave the Commonwealth, and uh, was saying that. Uh, well, anyways. Uh, no, my question I wanted to ask was, uh, 
was, you know, last episode with you and Judy Rever, you both talked about uh, Romeo Dallaire's real role in, in, you know, in the whole Rwanda thing and and lionizing Paul Kagame and whitewashing his crimes. Now, but I wanted to know, is Romeo Dallaire still seen as this uh, wonderful guy that the left still embraces or has or have or has the left sort of distanced himself from him and Canadian public at large after after he after Mr. Genocide experts said that he didn't consider the plight of uh, indigenous Canadians a genocide, specifically murdered and missing Aboriginal women. Yeah, I did. I did a story a couple of years ago about the layer where I, I quoted different sort of like left kind of figures or institutions and in their uh, support or endorsement of Dallaire. Dallaire, of course, is a general of the Canadian military who, who in fact, before the, going to Rwanda, he actually was a totally NATO-oriented general, as are, as are of, course, of course, most of Canada's military, because that's most of what Canada's military is oriented towards NATO, not to peacekeeping or other things that are, you know, the, the, uh, what they would define as the, uh, you know, un, unmanly or whatever kind of, uh, kind of missions. Um, so, so it's very odd that the Canadian left or progressive institutions would lionize Romeo Dallaire. And then the more you know about what Romeo has, you know, actually been involved with, and I should say right up until today, I saw a clip with Romeo Dallaire about, and I didn't get into it, I meant to in it previously. So Canada uh, opened, oh, announced they're opening up an embassy in Kigali during the mission. Uh, Trudeau said all kinds of positive things about Kagame, uh, said nothing about the violence that Rwanda has re, re, reinitiated in, in Eastern Congo that's you know, led to more than 170,000 people being driven from their homes in recent months. Um, uh, Delaire, I saw a clip of Delaire uh, uh, saying how, how happy he was that Canada's opening up the embassy in Kigali. Delaire until, until today with all of this now, it's been on the front page of the Globe and Mail, that it was Kagame that shot the plane down that led to the mass violence, that Kagame is assassinating uh, opponents in South Africa. He's been assassinating opponents all throughout Eastern Africa, and now it's increasing, you know, all the way down into South Africa. Prominent former top officials of his, of his regime, including trying to assassinate people in Belgium, like Rever, when she was in Belgium, she needed, she needed uh, uh, security services to protect her because there was some concern that they might, they might try, to, try to kill her there. Uh, even in Canada, right? There's a whole list of Rwandan uh, dissidents that have been uh, targeted in here in Canada. Um, so Dallaire continues to be a staunch uh, uh, Kagame supporter, but if, if you look through Dallaire, like Dallaire supported, you know, Canada's role in Haiti, bombing Libya. I mean, he's, he's an imperialist through and through. He's a militarist imperialist through and through. It's, it's shocking that he's, he has this sort of um, aura of being a, you know, whatever, sort of human rights kind of whatever. Um, like I said, I've said this, you know, the single biggest piece of propaganda that I've come across in Canadian foreign policy history is... Romeo Dallaire and his, specifically his book. Okay, so Romeo Dallaire's boss on the UN mission, Jacques Roger Boubou, who is a foreign minister of, the, of Cameroon. So Dallaire was in charge of the military component of the UN mission. Jacques Roger Boubou was in charge of the overall, overall political side of the UN mission. Jacques Roger Boubou published a book called Le Patron de Dallaire Parle, so the boss of Dallaire Speaks, which details Dallaire's support for the RPF, the support for Kagame's forces, um, his breaking of UN rules, a whole bunch of uh, a whole bunch of you know mix of like poor behavior and and geopolitical behavior that that Dallaire pursued on behalf of of uh, you know Washington, Ottawa, and the and the Kagame's forces. Dallaire's book, so um, uh, Jacques Roger Boubou's book. I, I did a search in Canadian Newsstand in 2016, I believe, and there was, I believe it was three mentions in Canadian newspapers. Um, uh, only one of them that you could call like sort of a, a summary of what was in the book. One was a letter in response attacking the summary. And one was, um, uh, I forget exactly what it was, but it was sort of like, you know, kind of critical of, 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 the, of uh, the book. Now you punch in Romeo Dallaire's book, uh, into a Canadian newsstand search. And I, I forget the number now, but it's like 1700, right? It's even more 
is uh, 1700 mentions. So, you know, the K media, you know, you're willing to like pump, pump, pump out the layers side of the story, but a foreign minister of an African government, right? The layer didn't even know, he himself says, he didn't even know where Rwanda was on the map before being dispatched. Jack Hoja Bubu, somebody who, you know, has a, a, a great deal more uh, uh, knowledge of, of African politics, of, of Rwanda, et cetera. Um, so that, you know, that's just a part of understanding how Dallaire uh, has, uh, you know, the sort of his aura in this country. Now, I should also point out that, you know, Dallaire and all the stuff around Dallaire is not just because of the person himself. It's because of how it is used in Canadian mythology and specifically foreign policy mythology. He's used and the whole Rwanda examples used as it's supposed that we didn't intervene enough. Right? If we just would have intervened more, then the bad things wouldn't have happened. Now, what actually happened is far, far more complicated than that, but that's how it's used in, in imperial uh, uh, mythology and ideology. Also, it has this whole benevolent Canada element to it, right? And, 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 so, and so it's, it's, it's a tool for, you know, uh, it's a tool used in basically Canadian uh, foreign policy mythology, and that's part of why um, uh, Delaire, uh, you know, is sort of so lauded and um, uh, uh, whatnot. So you should try to get somebody uh, to to translate that book of uh, of uh, of Delaire's former boss, because I tried to search for it on Amazon, but it's only but they only have a French version of it. You shouldn't be buying anything from Amazon. <laughs> Are there any other uh, questions or I comments? had my hand up Eve. go ahead go ahead Nadia um first of all I want my hats off to you for being so courageous uh I have never seen anyone as courageous as you are uh, I'm even afraid that someone is going to kill you that's that's how <laughs> <laughs> that's how I feel courageous you are um, my question is, um, like, you are up against a whole imperial country. Um, like, how, how, what do you expect? I mean, how do you expect this to, to, to end, uh, the, the aggression to end? And uh, what is the, the rest of the world? What is the opinion of the rest of the world of Canada right now? When you say aggression end, you mean in, in what do you mean? Specifically you Russia, the American Empire, or American Empire? Yes. Yeah. I, I don't know. I think I think there's a real danger that we're just we're going down more and more escalate, escalatory path. I mean, Canada. The other thing on the, the weekend, Canada sent two more naval vessels uh, to the to the Baltic and North Sea. So there's already two Canadian naval vessels, and of course the Lithuania. Uh, their blockade on uh, Kaliningrad, the uh, Russian territory that's uh, to the to the west, uh, that has a real possibility of leading to all kinds of escalation. And of course, there's 700 Canadian troops in in Latvia, just north of uh, Lithuania. So if if war gets into the Baltics, Canada's right on right on the front line there. And and you know they're they're sending naval vessels, clearly with that in mind, right? Um, so. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, like this is, you know, we're sleep, you know, to say that we're sleepwalking towards, you know, nuclear war is not, I mean, I think it's still unlikely, but, this, you know, it's the, the odds of this are way too high for any modestly uh, uh, sensible person to, to accept. And how uh, does the world view Canada? And, and so, yeah, I, I, you know, I don't know. I mean, I think that uh, the UN vote two years ago was a sign of how the world views Canada and Canada lost badly for its bid and it's the second time in a row losing its bid for the Security Council. Um, you know, I, I think that um, you, you, look, what's happened in, in Ecuador and these protests, I, I find, I find if, you know, over the past 15, you know, since participating in Haiti solidarity in 2004, 2005, and that's when I sort of became cognizant of how bad Canadian foreign policy was and whole process of, you know, learning a Canadian foreign policy. What I can say with a high level of confidence is that the consciousness of the left, mostly the radical left, on Canadian foreign policy is way, 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 way higher than it was 
15 years ago. And one example I was just mentioning, uh, uh, I was talking about uh, recently is on Ecuador. So this um, Owen Shaw, uh, Sh 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 Shark, I don't know how to pronounce his last name, uh, who writes a lot for Canadian Dimension, he has a piece that he came out right away about Canada's position on Ecuador and the recent protests. Very good piece. People, people should take a look at it. And he's been writing these pieces about a lot of different, a lot of different issues. And, and now it's like there's, a, there's a, a segment of the Canadian left that just assumes that Canada is supporting the corporate interests, supporting the, the empire's interests, and, 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 uh, and you know, try to cover the issue from that perspective. Now, you know, what the reach of this is, is you know, very small. The left is very, we're in a very weak time. Uh, there's no doubt about that. But, but I think that there is this sort of uh, a layer of, of deepened consciousness around the fact that Canada is this whole business about a force for good or peacekeeper, or all this kind of nonsense about Canadian foreign policy history, um, people don't believe anymore. People just assume uh, a segment of the left, at least, assumes the worst. And I think that's new. I don't think that was the case in 2005, 2006, 2004, um, around, around at the time of the Haiti. It certainly wasn't the case for myself. And I don't think it was the case for a lot of people at that time, you know, so where that all leads, I don't really think it's, it's having, an, it's not having an impact really on, uh, on the NDP yet. I think on some issues on Palestine, you know, you see some issues where it is having some impact, um, but, but uh, certainly not on, you know, Ukraine or Russia. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know the answer. I mean, the answer is just, we, we, we keep struggling, we keep uh, uh, fighting and, and uh, you know, I mean, what what's going to happen? You know, I think that the in the case of Ukraine and Russia, these are you know obviously forces that are way bigger than than um, than the Canadian left that are mostly responsible for it. what's going to happen. And and but we can have some impact around the edges, and where we can, we should uh, we should try to assert assert um, you know be it pushing the NDP to start calling for negotiations. Uh, um, so, thank you. Eve, Suzanne Weiss has had her hand up for a long time. Oh, go, go ahead, Suzanne, sorry. Uh, I'll maybe make this, unless there's anybody else, we'll try to make this the last question so go ahead, or comment. Um, thank you so much, Eve, for your, uh, your courage and for all the work you do. Thank you. Uh, I just want to point out that I believe there's going to be a demonstration in Toronto uh, on Wednesday um, at the Christie uh, Freeland uh, office there. Um, I'm just wondering, I think that the main issue is going to be NATO. Do you think the main issue we should focus on is NATO or what's your opinion? I mean, I, I think that's this, this, the, 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 the simplest slogan is Canada to NATO. I thought that, uh, I don't know if people saw, but uh, Tamara Lawrence, uh, a, a really uh, great um, uh, activist and, and author, and uh, she, she uh, uh, disrupted Freeland's, um, where uh, Zelensky did his, uh, to Canadian university students, I think on Wednesday or, or Thursday, um, she disrupted the uh, story. She was, she was in, I think, in, in Kitchener at, uh, at the, the showing, the screening of it there. And she had a sign, I forget the exact, but it was something like, uh, stop lying. Um, let's see if I can find it quickly on, on, uh, on my Twitter. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it was, it was, a, it was a slogan that was, uh, uh, I thought, uh, you know, a bit more than just Canada to NATO. I'm not sure that that, fully explains it. I, I think that, you know, talking about, um, you know, how Canada undermined the Minsk Accords is, is part of trying to get us out of the mess that we're in. Talking about how Canada helped oust Yanukovych in 2014. I don't think any of those things are, are easy to do as, as slogans. Um, so I understand why the, the you know, the, the, the NATO um, uh, demand is sort of simpler. Um, uh, but, uh, yeah, so let's see if I can find, uh, what she said exactly. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I think Canada to NATO is, a, is, a, is, a, you know, there's a lot of people that NATO has come back onto the radar. So, 
so, you know, making it clear. Yeah, so what she said was uh, stop lying. She had a, a, a poster or, or, or sign that said, stop lying, so, stop sending weapons, stop NATO and stop the war. Peace in Ukraine, peace with Russia. So I thought that was a pretty good in terms of uh, whether, you know, 12 were uh, 14 words or whatever that is exactly a pretty, pretty good kind of uh, slogan to direct at, at Canadian um, uh, 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 politicians and specifically Freeland. And I should say uh, that people should, there are rallies taking place in other cities as well. Here in Montreal tomorrow, there was a rally at uh, uh, Comp Complex Guy Favreau at 5.30. I'm going to be uh, going to that. That, uh, that, is, that as well is a Canada to NATO uh, uh, rally. Um, and I, but I think the other part of the, the NATO, uh, why the NATO rallies are happening, uh, you know, the focus on NATO as a slogan is also that the NATO summit is taking place uh, in, in, in Spain. Uh, and I believe there were, you know, thousands of people marching in, in Madrid, I believe, uh, uh, yesterday. Um, so I think that, you know, that putting that back on the, the Mouvement Québécois pour la Paix, when we started, uh, three or four years ago, what we really started off with was a, was a demonstration where the, the, the whole focus was, uh, uh, uh Canada out of NATO. And, and I think it is important for, uh, for anti-war forces to to put that um, position on the uh, on the uh, on the political radar, as much as it is a you know it is a marginalizing position. Let's be really you know clear about that. Um, but it's something that certainly needs to be uh, uh, needs to be raised. Uh, so uh, I guess on that note, I'll uh, I'll uh, thank every thanks everyone for for participating, and uh, I hope you. What did you say the demonstration was uh, tomorrow? In, in Montreal, it's at Complex Guy Favreau oh. on uh, René Lévesque and uh, Saint Laurent, mm -hmm. and it's at uh, 5.30. Nothing in Toronto. And there's, there's, there's some, in, and I believe uh, Suzanne said on, it's Wednesday in, uh, in Toronto at Christian Friedland's office. Eve, this is Laurel talking. I can't figure out how to put my hand up, um, but, uh, but I, I wanted to make a comment about the recent events in, in England, where apparently the Conservatives lost two by-elections and it's starting to look as if Boris Johnson is going down seriously as Prime Minister. And I was wondering whether you thought there was any possibility at all that Trudeau would, would suffer uh, support and, and interest and um, the backing of uh, Canadians over the next few months over the summer because a lot of things are happening. Um, you know, inflation is up eight to 9%. Um, there, there's, there, Leuna is on strike. He's lost about 50% of his support. Um, the cost of petrol is not making that much difference to people, but it might down the road. And, and, and there's a possibility that he could, he could, he could be suffering this summer um, from, from the, how the economy is going, not so much the war in Ukraine, but the, how the economy is. And then if one could link that to the war in Ukraine, Ukraine there might be a way to, to, to push him around. Yeah, I mean, I don't know that much about the internal uh, English politics. My guess is that uh, Johnson has, you know, he got a big scandal around uh, the COVID uh, rule breaking and all that stuff that may have contributed to this. Um, I, I, I don't, I, I, I think in the Canadian context, and I, I, certainly in, in some of the European countries, there's no doubt that, that the, the economic crunch and increased costs is that people associate with what you know, sanctions or the war, uh, that, that is a major political factor. I don't think it's as, as clear in North America um, uh, as, as it is there. And I don't think people, you know, blame uh, uh, the government as much uh, for its policies on Russia, Ukraine, and having maybe contributed to that stuff. Um, what I would say in the Canadian context is, is I wouldn't be totally, uh, I think it's unlikely that that would be necessarily for the benefit. I think that might lead to a uh, Pierre Pierre Polievre, uh, uh, kind of a, a situation in the in the shorter or medium term. I think that Trudeau, uh, there is a lot of you know frustration with Trudeau, but I don't know that it's um, unfortunately it's not uh, coming from the left as much as it as it is I think from the right, uh, which is kind of uh, uh, 
uh, astounding. Um, so I, I, I don't, I mean, I, I, yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, when, when people are hit uh, financially, that, you know, opens their eyes up to uh, political issues, and, and there is a po possibility for anti-war movements to try to, um, you know, raise that. I, I think we certainly should be raising the fact that we have all this money that we're plowing into NORAD and we're plowing into the military when there's much more important uh, social uses uh, uh, and, uh, you know, um, but um, I, I, I'm, I'm a little hesitant to be uh, uh, too excited about the uh, sort of short to medium term um, ramifications of, of, of the war in, in, uh, in Ukraine um, on Canadian politics. I would, venture to guess are not going to be the type of ramifications we would we would want no yeah you're because we're not getting hit directly the way the europeans are but i think we're going to see some 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 economic things happening i i read one thing that one in four uh people with a mortgage are, are going to have to sell their home they're saying one in four canadians and and the price of food is going up and and the cost of, of gas doesn't seem to matter so much to people, but it, I think it's going to go up and, the, and it might start to matter. So there, there's some stuff coming down that might have some of the same effect that, that it's having in Europe. And, and, and then we might, then it might, it might have put some pressure on Trudeau. I don't know. Yeah, but the alternative is, is the conservatives. So we're not any better off, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think that real alternative is is the extent to which we can get organized. I think that it's you know the yeah. NDP, the NDP could benefit from these things as well. I mean, the NDP, I think the 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 sort of corporate gouging message the NDP is trying to trying to push um, is attractive to to you know a lot of people. Um, uh, whether they're you know how far the NDP is willing to go with things, I don't. I'm, I, I'm skeptical, but but I think that. I don't think we need to, we don't need to wait till there's some sort of like, you know, the people's lives are getting worse before we start uh, raising the question of Canada to NATO or stop spending so much on the military. We can put those uh, to the forefront now, to the extent that we can, we should be putting those to the forefront now. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, seeing the dynamics, uh, after, but I, I, I do, I do not need to go cause I have two, two little, uh, little kids. Um, but thanks everyone for, for, uh, coming out and, uh, I look forward to, uh, another session next week. And also, again, if people have, uh, ideas about, uh, speakers and, and, or even subjects, uh, please do uh, send me, uh, uh, an email or a message. Thanks. Good night, everyone. Okay.